Hi guys, my name is Nicolette Mashile. I am also known as the Financial Bunny. Welcome to the Financial Bunny TV. Today I want to talk all things self-publishing. Now, I have written two books so far. I'm actually writing my third book. Um, I've written What's Your Move, which was quite a, a bestseller in the country. So I'm really excited about that. And then also I wrote Coco the Money Bunny, which is a children's financial literacy book, which um, we're still steadily climbing in terms of getting the book into the right spaces. Um, and, and this is quite important that I say this part because this is also going to, I'm going to speak about it a little bit later on, right? So where do you actually start when you're writing a book and you want to self-publish, right? Um, so let me give you a bit of a background story. Of course, um, I started doing financial literacy a couple of years ago. In actual fact, my company, Financial Fitness Bunnies, was registered in 2017. And then when I was registered in 2017, I started doing financial videos on Facebook. Um, I had a page called, I still have a page called Financial Literacy with Nicolette Mashile. And we were doing really well in terms of it. So then in 2017, I registered the company and um, opened up a YouTube channel, right? So with the YouTube channel, everything was going well. And then I thought, you know what? Actually, let me write a book. I started writing the book, I think, in 2019. Um, in actual fact, 2019, September, I was done with the book. And when I was done with the book, surprisingly, um, I started getting quite a number of um, publishing companies sending me publishing um, deals. Now, <laughs> as the financial money, you know, you, you kind of go through the entire publishing deal and you want to really understand what value is the publishing company going to bring to you and who you are and the book that you are writing. And based on the way the publishing deals were kind of structured, it was just something that wasn't going to work for me. Um, one, and perhaps maybe people want to know why, I think one um, the financial models that a lot of publishing companies use, I do, I do not do not appeal to me, um, simply because at the end of the day, it's my intellectual property, and I, I I price my intellectual property on a certain level. But two, also because I felt that I had built a brand before I actually wrote this book, so I was hoping that my brand could ride the wave in terms of you know um, 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 selling this book. Um, and thirdly, my reason which is probably one of the most important ones was how I was going to sell this book. So for me, the book was not going to be sold in the most traditional manner. I, at that point in 2019, when I got this publishing deal, the idea was that this book would become a brand building exercise for me to become a, a better voice in the financial literacy space. Um, being that many of you know that I didn't actually study finance, um, and at the time in 2019, I had actually just started my MBA and I had not actually done things like strategic finance, economics, you know, all of those common subjects that one would do to be able to get a better understanding of finance. I then did it only to find out that you actually, <laughs> they actually teach you corporate finance in those spaces and not personal finance. So, because also in, this, in the absence of there being a specific personal finance qualification, you've got to use other tools to be able to build your brand in terms of being a, a thought leader, being an expert voice in the financial literacy space, the consumer financial education space. So, the book was one way for me not only to um, share my stories, but also to do a little bit more research in terms of understanding. I mean, yeah, you understand insurance because you've got an insurance policy, but you really understand insurance. And I think that's what the book actually did for me. And that was the main driver of writing a book for me personally. So again, as I said, because of that, my sales strategy would probably look different from the ordinary uh, author who really just wants to write a book, get it into bookshops and sell it. So the publication, the publishing deals, because traditionally they look at the model of, you know, you've got a book, we take it to the bookshop, we sell the book, it did not appeal to me, which is why publishing deals just did not make sense. And to be quite fair, um, and no, no specific bashing of any publication company, the, 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 the model is a bit scary for me, okay? Um, you know, those guys have been in the industry for so long, they work on a... On a, on, a, on a scale business. So they're not writing one book or editing one book. They're not marketing one book. They're not doing... In fact, I found out when I when I questioned my publishing deal, they don't actually do full-on marketing. They do more of what is called publicity. Now, as I said, at that point, I was getting radio interviews. I was getting television interviews. I 
did not need any publicity. The publicity was coming anyway, being in this niche space that I was in. So again, I, I remember once saying to one of the publication companies, save me all your upfront costs, let me pay you, so that we've got a better split in terms of how much we're going to take. Granted, I don't take away the fact that they've got the expertise to give you the best editors, they've got the expertise to get you the best typesetters, to get you the best designers, to get you into certain bookshops, to get you into certain awards. But at the end of the day, that was not what I was chasing, so it did not appeal to me. So that means I was left out into the cold because I then had to figure out every single little thing by myself. I was lucky enough to find a lady who had worked in the publishing uh, business, who was actually in a publication publishing company, and then she started her own thing. And she literally held my hand in terms of helping me step by step what needed to happen. Because let me tell you, certain things I wouldn't have done because I didn't know they existed, right? But also working, uh, coming from an advertising background, I was quite lucky because some things I kind of knew. Um, you know, things like what typesetting actually is, what proofreading is, all of those things are new. But one of the things I remember saying to her very specifically is that she must find me an editor who is going to edit in my voice. So I made the gentleman actually watch my YouTube videos because I didn't want him to edit my voice out of a book, but I also wanted him to write a very simple book, a book that is easy to read. I didn't want to complicate, I wasn't trying to prove to anybody that I can speak English, um, I wasn't trying to prove to anybody that I could, um, um, I understood finance. In actual fact, I must tell you, when I wrote the book in 2019 and I was done with it in September, I realized that I had written the book for the industry to try, to try and prove to the industry that I understood finance. And I realized that's not who my target audience is. My target audience is the ordinary man on the street who wants to understand personal finances. So I had to rewrite the entire book. Um, and I think by April 2020, when lockdown hit and I knew I had to get this book released, these people were home. Um, and actually, I changed my strategy at that point. We'll talk about that a little bit later on. That's when I decided that, no, this book needs to be for people by a person and not by a financial expert, not by a financial professional, but by a human being and it's going to people. And that was really one of the most um, important or probably um, when they say, what is your source in the magic or what is that? Where's the magic and the magic is in your source. And that was my source, was writing a book by a person for people. Right, okay. So this lady got me an editor, we edited the book, guys, this man did amazing. Let me tell you what the magic is. You don't just get somebody who knows English, who knows grammar, who knows the language. You get somebody who knows the industry that you are writing in. The reason why I say this is because, for instance, where I would make examples of a financial product, I was very much adamant of always using the Satrix Top 40. And you was like, you sound repetitive. Use another one. So you bring in the S&P 500. You would bring in other financial instruments to use as alternatives for the ones that I had over-relied on. He would say, um, you've repeated this. You've already said this. This is not factually correct. Let me help you. Because sometimes I would write things, not necessarily they're not factually correct, but I would write them and, 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 and I don't give context. So you give context and help me with that. The other thing that I think he was really incredible in was flow, making sure that the book kind of takes people through a journey, you know? Um, and I think also one of the other really, really important things was I'm not a financial advisor. And the book, at some point, when I first wrote the first manuscript, it would give financial advice. And it would say, if you word it like this, it doesn't sound like you're giving financial advice, you're probing a question, or you do. And I mean, that gentleman was just fantastic for the editing of my book. In fact, I use him to edit most of my stuff. Um, then the second thing we had done, funny enough, I actually had the book cover done even long before I finished the manuscript. Even with my second, my third book, my cover is already done. So I always start with the cover because the cover then sets the tone of what the book is going to sound like. So if you look at the What's Your Move cover, you already kind of know where my biases are. Of course, I'm biased to women. Um, so you kind of have an idea. You see with this book that I'm writing, there are no gender biases. I'm very strict because I'm writing about making money and everybody's got the right to make money right so um, the book cover was already done and then the other thing that I didn't know that I found out is that you need to have what is called an ISBN number I thought you just create a barcode guys and just throw a barcode there but no so I registered with um, um, the, the, the I think it's a national uh, what something of libraries in South Africa you get an ISBN number so you tell them what your book's name is what um, kind of um, 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 umbrella um, topic you're going to write about, 
and they issue you with what is called an ISBN number, right? Once you've got your ISBN number, you then go to a barcode generating company and you get your barcode, but you give them the ISBN number, which they then add to your barcode. So now you've got a barcode that goes on the back of your book. That is what is called an identifier of your book. So if they were to scan your book, they would know it's all scan the barcode, they would know who the book belongs to. Shop, we've done all of that. Then we would then we gave it to the guy who designed the cover and the back, and he designed all of that. In fact, let me not lie, I didn't know that he had to design the back. So I didn't know I had to write a little short blurb about the book on the back. Um that's you know, so we had to have a back cover page. I didn't know. So once the lady was type sitting, she didn't say to me, where the covers? And I was like, well, okay, I've got the front cover, so you need to also do a back cover. So I had to write a blurb, right? And then also there's a thing called a spine, and that's the spine of the book. That also needs to be designed. So you've got to design a front cover, spine, back cover, and in some instances you also need to design the in in inner cover. So the first front cover, right? Um, but for me, the type is that then that is just to talk about what the book is about, what's the ISBN number, first publication, who the publishing company is, and if you want to put any other disclaimers, you've got to put it in there. Then you've got to have, because then I said, I also want to sign my book. So then she gave me a blank page where I could sign, and then she types it to the rest of the book. So now you've got to choose fonts. You've got to choose all sorts of things. And while you're choosing the font, you've got to remember that while you're choosing font, you also choose the paper that you want your book printed on. She gave me the advice that printing on a white, clean, white page is not great for books because books give people a feeling. So she went with a creamy, bulky page, um, you know, slightly off-white with um, um, a font that was legible for everybody to be able to see. Then I said, what this make the book thick? And she said, you know what, look, you can print the book on different paper and you will be able to see the thickness, right? So one, if you print it on thin paper, this is the thickness that you would get. If you print it on a thicker paper, this is the thickness that you would get. So of course, I chose a little thicker page um, simply because I also don't want the book to rip. Um, if somebody is making a, a note on the paper, I don't want that to become a, an issue. Right, so now we need to go and figure out what is the cost of printing. So you need to go and find a printer. While you're finding a printer, you've got to give them page numbers, font, colors, all of the stuff that you need to be able to give to the printer so they've got an idea of what it is or what type of a book you want to print. Right, so now you are at the printers. But while you're doing all of this printer uh, job and, and parallel to it, you need, because you're self-published, it means that you don't have a distributor. So it means that you need to figure out how you're going to distribute. So I then set up three different types of distribution channels, right? My first distribution channels were the bookshops because remember, my idea was that I would go to events, I would sell my book at events or as a package, or if I get a brand campaign, my book would be one of the things that I was pushing. Then COVID hit and gave us a bit of a spanner in the works. So we had to change this, the strategy as quickly as possible. So the first thing I did was I went to the bookshops and they got told by the bookshops that you need to come with a distributor. I then said to them, no, I don't want to add a layer of somebody else taking a portion of my sales. So I want to distribute directly to the bookshops. One of the bookshops exclusive books gave us the deal and said, no, you can't. So we had to prove that I was a brand, that this book would sell and all of that jazz. They still didn't believe us. So what we then did is we set up a pre-orders sales channel. So got my designer to set up an actual um, website where you could go on the website, find out of the book and it's called www.whatsyourmove.co.za. And from that site, you could press order the book and it will go into a cart. In the cart, we then in, uh, uh, incorporated a e an e-commerce platform. The e-commerce platform that I used was a Shopi Shopify. Of course, Shopify has got its own licenses. You then need to add the product onto Shopify, and then you've got to connect the two to your website. So when a person press add to cart, it actually goes onto the Shopify um, 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 uh, um, dashboard. Then we need to have what is called a payment gate. So you can either use the likes of Yoko, you can use Peach Payments, you can use Payflex. We use Payfast. And basically on the Payfast, it will take you to the payment gate. You put in your credit card details and you are able to pay. Now, of course, this kind of gave us a bit of a challenge because it's South Africa. A lot of people don't believe in using their credit cards. So this was a bit of a challenge. So we lost a couple of sales because of that. 
and this remember is before the book is actually now going to launch officially which our launch date was going to be first of august it's women's month and we're really excited as i said i had biases towards women so this is a whole part of it right but the book was officially available to buy on a pre-order basis i think from the 26th of july if i remember so we're really excited and we're thinking okay we will take the pre-sales and we will show the bookshops that there is a demand for this book right that's what we did then the third channel that we used was take a lot and we had to upload so you register on take a lot there's also a fee that you're going to be paying but they take it from your sales um and then on take a lot you would then upload the pictures of your your, your product and you would now be ready to sell so you've got a dashboard for a supplier so it's called the seller dashboard where you can upload um, a certain amount of books that you want to sell the pricing and all of that stuff right Shop. So now we've also got take a lot. So take a lot, unlike Amazon, you actually have to physically send a product. Whereas with Amazon, which we did a lot later on because we started seeing the demand coming in from other countries, with Amazon, you only upload the manuscript as it is print ready, as a print ready file. And then Amazon, on a need basis or on an order basis, Amazon will then print when somebody actually buys your book, which is Quite a big advantage, and I'm hoping that Take A Lot can move into that direction soon because it really minimizes a printing cost that a lot of self-publishing people sometimes are not able to bear. I must tell you, my first uh, my first cost that I paid to this lady, she was doing the editing, or well, she was subcontracting someone to edit for me. She did the typesetting, getting the book print ready, checking for gremlins, copy, um, and proofing, and uh, proofreading. I paid, and plus... I think it was printing of, I think my first batch was 2,000 copies. I paid almost 90,000 rand. So this shows you that you do need to have a huge capital outlay in the beginning so that you are able to actually push out the volumes. But I was also pushed to print out 2,000 because our pre-sale, guys, it shot up so quickly. It was insane. I think by week two, we were selling on almost one point something pre-sale. Um, 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 orders and I took that spreadsheet and I went to the bookshop and I said look what did I tell you remember the bookshops are coming in as a partner to you they're saying we'll give you shelf life we'll advertise you if we we have the budget and with all of that we'll do promotions for you in store but people trust to come to a bookshop to buy as opposed to from buying from an online platform because with the bookshop if it doesn't get delivered they just walk straight into the shop so they come on as a partner and they want your book to be successful they need it to be successful because they also need to make money from it because they do take a substantial cut from your actual sales so we eventually got into the bookshops. We couldn't get into the other bigger book, bookshop um, line in South Africa, but we got into it via a distributor. But also, while you're getting into the bookshop, for instance, you do also need to contact each and every single um, branch or, 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 or what's, the, what's the English word? Franchise of that bookshop to tell them and introduce them to your book and what your book is all about. So that, because remember, they, they, they operate as franchises especially the ones that are outside of South Africa. So we had a, an exclusive books uh, Botswana and exclusive book Namibia who were selling our books. And then I also went on an exercise to tell the guys in my team to say, look for other bookshops in other areas. So we look for bookshops in uh, uh, Kingdom of Eswatini. We look for bookshops in Lesotho, so in bookshops in Zimbabwe, bookshops in Kenya. And this was to be able to open up a bigger distribution channel for the actual book. All right, shop. Now... The biggest hurdle comes is that now you've got all of these pre-orders they came directly to us and now we need to find a way to deliver them and what we did not factor in is that people order from anywhere in south africa now obviously when you go to these career guys they've got boundaries in terms of where do they go and where do they not go right i remember one specific story i'll never forget so what we did is i hired i brought my family and i was like everybody's got a car jump on because brought my uncle in from bush for great and we're like we're going to deliver these books especially because we told people they're going to get them on the first of august we're going to get these books out to people even if we must start a week ahead because we've got the copies they've arrived here let's get this book out guys 
So we divided South Africa. So my provinces were Gauteng and Northwest. I remember this one specific lady, and I'm sure she remembers if she sees this video. She, we looked for her address. We looked for her address on the GPS, nothing. I said eventually, I said, no, WhatsApp. I said, babe, please send me a WhatsApp location. Drop me a location. Drops me this location, guys. I put it on the GPS. We're following this location, and she out of the blue. The road just ends. And I'm standing on the one side. She's standing on the other side. We can see each other, but there's no road infrastructure to get to each other. And I was so humbled by all of this because I could not believe, you know, how far my brand had gone. How far the book had gone in terms of getting this book out to people. And it was just magical for me. I mean, I went to parts of South Africa I'd never even known or heard about. I mean, my teams that were in, 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 in free states were going to Velkom, they were going to Kruanstad, they were going to all sorts of areas. And it was just an exciting time for us. It was the most challenging part. We did under-deliver there. We did disappoint a couple of people. But you know what? We, we did what we needed to do. And that's why I say I appreciate the role that bookshops also play because it helps with the distribution. I appreciate the job that Take A Lot does because it helps with that. And I appreciate lines like Paxi, which is Pip, Postnet, and everything that they did for us. And guys, we did amazing in terms of, you know, getting this book to the right people. My day-to-day -day, at the time when the book got released, I would literally wake up at around about four or half past four leave my house come to Bram to melville to my office from half past five i'm signing books i'm putting them in order of where they need to be delivered to there's a young lady we also brought on who owned the courier company who was helping us we would pack the books we would sign them we put in a uh, little sticky notes on them to make sure that it gets to the right person because one of the things we did have was a wastage where we would sign a book and then the person's already received it or would sign the wrong name and you know once you start signing so eventually the rato in my office bought me a pen that i could erase because i was getting names wrong i was tired you know so from half past five for instance up until seven o'clock i'm signing books i'm packing them so that when the team arrives around half past eight i'm sitting in the makeup chair at daily teta and i'm doing daily teta they are making sure that the books get delivered and then it's a big chunk so one person would be doing postnet the other person would be doing pip then we would call um uh, this lady called anele she would be doing uh, uh deliveries in johannesburg sometimes the college is doing deliveries when she comes back from daily teta if there are books around this area santon area i would be doing those deliveries guys it was insane so what am i trying to say is that self-publishing is a, a very fulfilling journey um it is difficult but it's very fulfilling you will make your money if you've got a good strategy um some of our other strategies were selling to corporates um financial institutions were using it as gifts and as i said lockdown also really helped us because brands didn't know um what to do so you're doing a webinar but also doing like um prize uh, competitions and then the book would be a gift so we did all of that we also sent out a number of free books to a couple of influential people get them to read the book you know share about it um my social media channel really did an amazing job in terms of getting this book out to people people's testimonials um that is powerful make sure that people are giving you feedback giving you testimonials reviews on the different sites all of these things will really help um as I said, putting the book together, I did use professional editors. I did use a professional typesetter. I used professional distributors, um, designers. But there are alternatives. If you don't have a big budget, I would suggest that you look at Grammarly as an app to edit. Um, but also don't rely overly on Grammarly. If you do great Grammarly, rather than get someone to proofread, or you can do it other way, get an editor, but then you use Grammarly to do your final proofreading where gremlins might have snuck in. After you use Grammarly, if you want to design, you can use apps like Canva. On Canva, you can design. Yesterday, I was talking to a gentleman who said, I don't even have a laptop to type out my manuscript. On your phone, there is a note. Most of the new smartphones have like a note. I know iPhones got a note. I know that Huawei and Samsung have notepads. And there's a speaker or a mic that you can use where you can read your book and the phone will actually transcribe or type out what you are saying 
then you transfer that onto a word document so there's various ways to come around it as i was speaking about the front cover you know use the likes of of canva to design your front cover a simple front cover um you can get that done there and then as i said if you want to set up an e-commerce shop you can literally either use your social media these days you can connect social media to shopify so you put in a button there where you just set up shopify but on your instagram on your facebook on your uh, 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 um, um twitter and in and and, and and youtube you can add links instagram and facebook it will actually have a button that is uh, is connected to your um your, your 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 shopify account and you can press there and it will take the person straight to the 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 the, the, the e-commerce site and then they can um have a payment gate with take a lot take a lot as i said is a little different you do need to get the the actual product and then what happens is that you will book your product for delivery to the two dcs the two, only two distribution um centers there's one in cape town and one in johannesburg and then once you've done that you will then um get what is called a barcode for that specific booking then you take the barcode and you stick it on top of your own barcode on the actual product um and then you also need to put a bar code on the box that you are sending you do need to book in a time slot they don't allow you to just arrive which makes sense imagine if all of us arrive at the same time it take a lot so you do need to make sure that you are arriving there on time it's easy if you are in cape town and you're delivering to a dc in cape town or if you're in joburg you're delivering. but when you are not at either one of these locations and you've got to send a courier company you almost have to brief them to say you need to arrive between 10 and 11 and that was also one of the challenges that we had um if you are going to be using paxi or, 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 or a taxi sends out SMSs, so you must make sure that you are meticulous when it comes to how you capture people's information. So from the order page on Shopify, make sure that you are copying. We used to use spreadsheets, Excel spreadsheets, and we would check every single time do we have the right person i mean we made a couple of mistakes where the wrong book went to the wrong person but we would rectify it as soon as possible apologize when you are sending if you've made a mistake if you do do postnet you get what is called a waybill and a waybill number make sure that you send your clients the waybill number so they can also track where their parcel is um i could speak the whole day about this and i don't want to do that because geez the video is already long but this is the wonderful world of self-publishing